from Quito, Ecuador, my name is Carla González and this is From the South, the morning news brief on Telesur English. We start this new edition right now. We begin in Chile, where Pope Francis met in private with victims of sexual abuse by Catholic priests at the end of the first full day of his visit. Crowds waved as the Pope arrived at the Papal Nunciator in Santiago for the meeting behind closed doors. Earlier in the day, Francis said he wanted to join with his brother bishops in asking forgiveness for the abuse by members of the clergy. I want to express the pain and shame that I feel for the irreparable damage done to young children by ministers of the church. But some victims of the abuse were not satisfied with the Pope's words. They and their supporters protested with black balloons as the Pope Mobile made its way through the Chilean capital. They said the bishops responsible for covering up the abuse should be in jail. And we have more on this protest in the next report. Pope Francis has been welcomed by crowds of Chileans and authorities which described his presence as a blessing for the nation. However, indigenous groups, human rights organizations, social movements and individuals are protesting against his visit. Abuse victims also joined the crowds in Santiago on Tuesday to denounce Pope Francis, speaking out against the church's record on covering up abuse scandals and reportedly protecting its officials mired in allegations. The demonstrators carry black balloons, which they released into the air close to when the pontiff was passing through. As head of a group of criminal priests, he's responsible. He should hand them over to justice and to follow the normal channels just like any other normal citizen. However, he protects and hides them. This is what we saw with Bishop Barros, who was at mass next to him in O'Higgins Park. In reality, it will be a great step forward if he recognizes that he is a criminal who covers up for other criminals. As the Pope was making his way to hold a mass in Santiago's O'Higgins Park, police forces clashed with several demonstrators and used water cannons to repress them. Several people were chased down and detained. For us, the Pope's visit hurts us deeply. I repeat, this does not have to do with faith. We do not want conflict with those people who feel something for this man. What worries us is that there are government officials who are involved in economic crimes. And there they are, sitting in there. Our Chilean criminals who work for the government are sitting in there with that man. LGBT members in Santiago staged a protest where they kissed in front of the police to protest what they believe is a discriminatory treatment of the church towards the LGBT community. <laughs> Regarding the Pope's visit, he is here doing his thing and we are here to take advantage so we can highlight the problems we have with the church. I don't believe that he has come here to resolve anything. He comes here to hold a mass, to carry out an activity, and we have to be able to get around that so that we can show that we truly need help. Footage shows police bundling a number of protesters into the back of vans. Also in Santiago, protesters dressed as nuns and denounced the high cost of the visit. The Chilean church's involvement in sexual abuse scandals also came up for protesters, and the Catholic church's popularity in Chile is now the lowest in Latin America. Many now see it as a pillar of the conservative establishment. Pope Francis, who said there will be zero tolerance in sex abuse case in the church, named Bishop Juan Barros, who had been accused of covering up the biggest pedophile of the Chilean church history. And following the reaction of rejection from the community and from the clergy, he called us idiots. Since last week, protesters have launched firebombs on at least four churches, including on Tuesday, Cuenco's local chapel. This visit by the Pope to Chile and Peru has seen perhaps the strongest protest against the Catholic Church of any of the Latin American tours. As the pontiff now journeys on to the city of Temuco, near the Mapuche community areas, it remains to be seen what further objections, demonstrations and actions will be staged against his presence. And after Chile, the Pope will visit Peru, 
where there are also growing voices of protest against the investment of $11 million by the Peruvian government to cover logistical costs of the visit. Our correspondent in Lima has the details. Pope Francis will be housed at Lima's Apostolic Nonchator. Nuns will oversee its food and the Swiss Guard will be in charge of security. A 10-car entourage will accompany the Pope Mobile in every city it intends to visit. The government has invested $11,400,000 to improve the infrastructure in these places. The investment covers community services, security for the Pope's retinue, and setting up the required infrastructure for the Papal Mass, which will gather over a million people in Las Palmas, close to 400,000 in Huanchaco, and 120,000 in Puerto Maldonado. The government's announcement of such a large investment for the Pope's visit was not well received by those polled on the street. I do not agree with spending such a large sum. We are a poor nation. Our streets are full of holes. We've been through so much. How could this be possible? The Vatican is the world's largest bank. They have so much money. We are a secular state and that wasn't considered before spending that money. We are financing the church using state funds. That should not be happening. We should be frugal while still celebrating his visit. Everyone is happy he's coming and he's not asking for this money. It's just wrong. While the government sets apart millions of dollars to fix the locations the Pope will visit, over 100,000 citizens have been waiting for a year to have their home rebuilt, as promised by the government after the devastation left by El Niño Costero. The government has invested less than a million dollars in rebuilding homes. With 11 million, we could have easily built anywhere between 15 and 1,800 homes. One of the affected communities would be visited by the Pope during his stays in Trujillo. Locals are hoping for a miracle, just like the other 3.5 million people who will mobilize to be present during the many activities he has planned. At least six people were injured in the Peruvian city of Chiclayo, after a police car crashed into a crowd of pilgrims en route to see Pope Francis. The police car lost control and ran over a crowd of pilgrims who had gathered in the city's main park. The car then swerved and smashed into a nearby truck. Among the injured were two women who were taken to the hospital in serious conditions. The details of the driver's condition are still unknown. A state funeral was held for Trinidad and Tobago's former president, George Maxwell Richards, on Monday. The statesman casket was taken through the streets of Port of Spain on Monday. The casket was escorted by members of the protective services. Richards, who died of a heart attack, was the country's fourth president. His time in office spanned from 2003 to 2013. And in Venezuela, when an armed group responsible for numerous attacks against government institutions has been neutralized after a dramatic standoff with security forces on Monday. The group and its leader, Oscar Perez, were defeated. Our correspondent in Caracas, Freddy Gillingham, has this report. Dramatic scenes unfolded on Monday as Venezuelan security forces laid siege to an armed cell. The El Junquito area in the hills just outside Caracas suddenly echoed to gunfire as a building believed to be harboring a group who have been on the country's most wanted list for months were finally tracked down. The group, apparently led by the former Venezuelan police pilot Oscar Perez, came to prominence for attacking government buildings in a stolen helicopter last summer. Other incidents followed, including stealing weapons from a military outpost. Videos of the group's threats and activities were given high priority by the international media, often portraying Perez as a kind of Rambo freedom fighter. But there was nothing heroic about this last encounter. Unfortunately, we had two young policemen killed while they were resting and waiting for these terrorists to give themselves up. They were shot in the head, both of them. And they also left six Bolivarian policemen seriously wounded who were fighting for their lives. 
So the commando groups had to take action, and they defeated one part of the terrorist group and arrested more than five who have given their testimony and told everything. The Ministry of Defense later confirmed the fate of the group. In the face of an aggression that put the life and integrity of our officers at risk, we followed the agreed protocols to neutralize the aggressors, with the unfortunate result of seven terrorists dead. We have to emphasize that the security forces follow the international and universal criteria for such situations that threaten the peace and public security. News of the siege and the group's eventual defeat came just in time for President Maduro's annual balance sheet of the past year. 2017 was a year which saw new levels of political violence from some sectors of the opposition. 2018 will most certainly bring new challenges here in Venezuela, but terrorism has been taken off the list for now. Freddie Gillingham, Telesor, Caracas. We'll be back very soon. Stay with us. Years after the detention of Milagro Sala, the human rights organizations that support her and political parties, as well as trade unions, marched in Buenos Aires to demand the immediate release of the social activists. More details in the next report. With a massive mobilization from the obelisk to the offices of the Jujuy provincial government, protesters marched against the illegal detention of Milagro Sala who was jailed on January 16th, 2016. What we said two years ago about Milagro Sala's case was that it would become a test case for the new legal mechanism that this government is using to persecute and repress activists. Like the other opposition leaders who have been detained, the head of the Tupac Amaru organization is seen by many here as a political prisoner of the Cambiemos Alliance government. There is a huge list of political prisoners in Argentina who are forced to submit to President Mauricio Macri's decisions and interests. He wants to eliminate the opposition in this country, so we are going to be permanently mobilized, demanding him to free them all. They also criticize the particularly harsh treatment, including clear human rights violations given to Milagro Sala and other political prisoners under the Macri administration. The main purpose is to sabotage opposition political parties, shut down social programs and make it easy for Macri's government to destroy Argentina. We will not allow this to happen. As you can see, the mobilizations are getting more attention. The Argentine people are not happy with this situation. Faced with this criminalization of protests, several deaths and the lack of constitutional rights, these Argentines say they are living under a permanent state of emergency. Brazil's former president, Luis Ignacio Lula da Silva, has promised to clear his name ahead of a ruling on his conviction for alleged corruption. Lula joined supporters and leaders of social movements for a rally at a theater in Rio de Janeiro on Tuesday night. He attacked the members of the judiciary who brought the accusations against him, saying they were false and politically motivated. I am trying to prove my innocence. I want to prove my innocence. That is why I'm the only politician that can look at a camera and say that the federal police lied in their investigations that the public ministry lied in their accusation, and the judge, Sergio Moro, lied in the sentence that he handed down. Outside the rally, Lula supporters also criticized the case against him, but some said the former president should make a self-criticism. The charges against the Workers' Party have never been relevant nor proven to this day. Brazilian people deserve to have Lula, but I think he can only make it if he evaluates himself. We should not be making a cult of personality. 
Brazilian legislators have blocked the president's attempt to privatize the country's state-owned electricity company, Eletrobras. De facto president Michel Temer issued a decree to make the company private last year. But the federal judge who ruled against it said it bypassed Brazil's Congress and it represented a direct attack on Brazilian public assets. Eletrobras is the biggest electricity company in Latin America. If privatized, electricity costs could be subjected to an increase. A military helicopter has crashed in the north of Colombia, killing all 10 people on board. Unfortunately, we are paying to update on behalf of our 10 people on board who died, four crew members, six passengers. 31 out of the 38 judges who will make up the special peace court in Colombia have been sworn in by President Juan Manuel Santos. The remaining seven will start their tenure in March. The Colombian president specified the judges have a vital mission, bring clarity to crimes committed during the armed conflict and those responsible so that they can be judged in a court of law. You will judge and punish criminal acts committed during or in relation to the armed conflict, not just by guerrillas or state agents but by civilians who took part in the conflict and may have been active participants in some of the most serious crimes. The Special Peace Court will start working with a model for transitional justice that looks to find balance between the right for peace and enforcing the law. It's in this balance where a victim's truth usually exists. A model of justice based on truth, on placing all your cards on the table in order to obtain legal benefits, but even more so, to obtain cultural and symbolic benefits for a society that has yet to turn the page, for a society that is in denial, that resists honoring life by moving forward with the truth. The judge's first order of business is to establish internal regulations and a bill of criminal procedure under which they will operate. But even if the judges will start work on Monday, they are still waiting for the Constitutional Court to review the regulatory law approved by Congress since this law imposed obstacles for human rights defenders. It makes absolutely no sense that human rights defenders would not be allowed to be judges. There aren't more transparent and suitable people for the job with a higher moral authority to take part in this process to uncover the truth and provide justice than human rights defenders. We know by heart everything that country has undergone. Moral para participar en este proceso. The start of the court's work is significant for victims since it marks the beginning of an integral system of truth, justice and reparations. Regardless, victims hope that the Constitutional Court will nullify some in-depth changes made to this project, like excluding third parties who had a hand in the armed conflict and all the obstacles put in place for human rights defenders. <laughs> Ecuador's electoral court has ruled that Lenin Moreno remains the president of the ruling party Alianza País. Several members of the directorate asked to have him removed because of his political differences with the leader of the Citizen Revolution, former president Rafael Correa. After the ruling, Correa's supporters announced they will form a new party called Citizen Revolution. Veteran Jamaican journalist and communicator Ian Boyne was laid to rest on Sunday. Mr. Boyne died last month after several heart attacks. The funeral was an almost day-long event, worthy of a man who, as deputy CEO of the Jamaican Information Service, served three prime ministers, all of whom were present at his funeral to pay their respects. He was lauded as a true patriot who, through his work, inspired many Jamaicans to excel. I speak on behalf of the Union of Prime Ministers that have benefited from his service. And right about this time, I would be in close contact with Ian because I'm going to, I would have had to lean on him for the preparation of my budget presentation. And so too would have Prime Minister Golding and Prime Minister Simpson Miller. So when you hear talk of a void left, it is a real void. Experts in Cuba are predicting an increase in forest fires in 2018 because of the damage caused by Hurricane Irma, which hit last year. 
The risk increased after Irma brought down trees, resulting in an accumulation of foliage on the ground. 2017 saw at least 350 fires, which damaged more than 6,000 hectares of land and caused huge economic losses for the nation. The United Nations puts Cuba ahead of reforestation efforts in the region. We'll be back very soon. Stay with us. The parliament in Spain's Catalonia region has been meeting for the first time since the country's central government dissolved the body and ordered new elections in response to an independence referendum. Ahead of the session, two separatist parties reached an agreement to support former Catalan president Carles Puigdemont as a candidate to again take that role. But questions remain over whether the wealthy northeastern region will continue to push for a split from Spain. And supporters of Catalonia's independence from Spain have gathered near the region's parliament building in Barcelona to follow the first session of a newly elected parliament. We are going to do it. I know that we are going to have a lot of problems with the Spanish government, but we are going to do it. On January 31st, Charles Puigdemont is going to be appointed. The story of an undocumented 30-year-old father of two who was deported to Mexico on Tuesday, is making headlines. Touching video shows Jorge Garcia saying goodbye to his wife and children at the Detroit Metro Airport. Garcia, who immigrated to the United States, was told he wouldn't be allowed to return home for a decade. According to Michigan United, a community organization, Jorge was two years too old to qualify for DACA. Since 2015, more than 5,000 children have died in Yemen as a result of the civil war. The international coalition, led by Saudi Arabia, has insisted that it is not blocking the arrival of humanitarian aid to Yemen. However, according to UNICEF, official figures about 11 million children in Yemen need humanitarian aid to survive. Two million are malnourished, and some 400,000 suffer from food shortages and cholera outbreaks forcing them to live in deplorable conditions. Clashes have erupted between Palestinians and Israeli forces in West Bank village of Yayus, following the funeral of a man killed by Israeli gunfire. 24-year-old Ahmad Salim was shot and killed while demonstrated on Monday. Israeli authorities say they opened fire because protesters were throwing rocks at them. Tension in the region has risen since U.S. President Donald Trump recognized Jerusalem as Israel's capital in December, reversing decades of U.S. policy. 18 Palestinians and one Israeli have been killed since. Reacting to U.S. President Donald Trump's decision to withhold $65 million in aid for Palestinian refugees, the United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres says he is concerned. If uh, UNRWA uh, will not be in a position to provide the vital services and the emergency forms of support that UNRWA has been providing, this will create a very, very serious problem and we will do everything we can to avoid this situation to occur. The United Nations Human Rights Office has voiced deep concern over the detention of Ahed Tamimi, the Palestinian girl arrested for hitting an Israeli soldier. In a statement, it said Tamimi should be granted special protection as a child in line with international law. Tamimi has been detained for almost a month now, and she was due to be released on Monday, but authorities extended her detention. We go to our correspondent, Nur Harassini, in Gaza for more. 16-year-old Ahed Tamimi, who is currently imprisoned in the Israeli jails, was expected to um, be released today. However, an Israeli court decided to extend her detention up to two more days. Israeli courts brought uh, 21 charges against Ahed. Uh, this means that she could face up to 14 uh, years in Israeli uh, jails. To many Palestinians and also many people around the world, um, Ahed Tamimi, 
is now a hero, a Palestinian hero, after uh, a video was uh, released showing uh, this child, this 16-year-old um, girl, pushing and uh, defending herself uh, against Israeli soldiers in uh, December. Many Palestinian peoples have head to the streets uh, yesterday, today, and are organizing more protests and rallies to be held uh, tomorrow and in the, the upcoming uh, days to support uh, Ahd Tamimi and also her family. No harassing from Gaza. Now let's have a look at some of the other stories from around the world. China has said that the recently concluded meeting in Canada about North Korea showed a Cold War mentality and would only undermine the settlement of the North Korean issue. The United States and Canada co-hosted the day-long meeting in Vancouver to discuss ways to increase pressure on North Korean leader Kim Jong-un. China did not attend the meeting, saying it would not help with efforts to resolve the North Korean nuclear issue. The United States and Canada as the conference sponsors, held a meeting in the name of the participating countries of the United Nations Common, which obviously showed a Cold War mentality. This can only create divisions within the international community and damage the joint efforts made to promote a proper settlement to the nuclear issue on the Korean Peninsula. 21-year-old Hong Kong activist Joshua Wong has been sentenced to a second jail term of three months for his role in the 2014 pro-democracy umbrella movement street occupations. Wong had refused to obey a court injunction order and leave a protest site. Several other activists were also jailed along with him. They can lock up our body, but they can't lock up our mind. What we hope to do is, even we need to face the prison sentencing, we will still continue to fight for democracy in the future. Thank you. Member of the Qatari royal family Sheikh Abdullah bin Al Thani, who was allegedly detained in the United Arab Emirates, has been transferred to a hospital shortly after his arrival to Kuwait. On January 14th, Sheikh Abdullah released a video statement saying he was a prisoner in the UAE and if anything happened to him, Abu Dhabi's crown prince Sheikh Mohammed is responsible. The bio tapestry is set to be displayed in the UK after France agreed it could leave its shores for the first time in a very long time. French President Emmanuel Macron is expected to announce the proposed loan of the tapestry, which depicts the Norman conquest of England in the 11th century during a visit to Britain on Thursday. He has said the tapestry would not be transferred before 2020. And with this, we've come to the end of this morning news brief. This and many other stories, you can find them on our website at telesurtv.net slash English. And you can also join us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. For Telesur English, I'm Carla Gonzalez. Thank you for watching.